What is going on everyone? Anthony Drew Gary here, host of the How To Show, where we talk about optimizing life, money, and happiness one how-to at a time. This week on the show, we are going to have some fun. And that's not to say we don't have fun every week on the show, but this week I've got another guest on the show. Actually, for the first time that I can remember, I have two guests coming on the show. Wendy and Curtis Mays are gonna join me. They have a podcast and a blog called The House of Phi, and they are going to talk about their story and how they changed their living situations in such a way that they were able to pay a massive amount of debt off in what's really a journey for them to get to a point of financial independence. And, and what I mean by that is to, to be able to have independence from having to go to work in any sort of capacity that's anything other than exciting or joy inducing and so they're working a plan so that they can get to a point where they can live their life on their own terms and I think it's a really exciting topic. I think that some of the things they're doing are are useful to a larger audience and, and there are a lot of applications and replicable tips that we're going to share in this video. So without further ado, let me switch over to Zoom and we will bring on Wendy and Curtis. Wendy, Curtis, welcome to the How To Show, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. Yes. Fantastic. So you guys have a story to tell. I think it's replicable. I think it's important. And I think that if we can get as many people to hear it and, and take something away for, from it that, that's going to be positive in their lives and have an impact, I think that's going to make a difference for a lot of people in a lot of ways. And so to, to dive into your story, you guys worked a plan you had a large amount of debt and, and you're just really driving to pay it off and, and just do some creative things along the way to get there. And so if you would go ahead and start from the beginning a little bit with me and talk to me about how you started, how you basically got yourselves into the situation that you're in or, or we're in and how you're working a plan to, to get yourselves uh, back out. Yeah, awesome. sure. Yeah. Do you want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So um, we've been working a plan for about um, a little over three years now. We um, came to find what's known as the, the FIRE community or Financial Independence Retire Early community about three years ago. Um, we were both 46 at the time. Um, at the time, I was still uh, in my law practice, and we were drowning in debt. We had... Uh, financed our American dream <laughs> into our mid 40s yeah. and were overextended in every single area living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. You know, we had uh, the half a million dream home in San Diego. We had cars, we had credit cards that we, you know, used to rehab our house, you name it, we had it. Um, but we were also in a place where we just didn't want to be living that way anymore. We had um, a, a couple years prior to that adopted four little boys and added to our family. So we were went from a family of four to a family of six. six. And so we were just in this hopeless spot where we needed my income as a lawyer to sustain our lifestyle, mm -hmm. but that's not what we wanted anymore. And we just really didn't know where to begin because it was such a big amount. You know, when we added up everything the house included, we were at a million dollars in debt, yes. which I mean, that's huge. Yeah. And I know that not everybody listening will maybe have had that much debt, but I think that they can maybe identify with the feeling, the feeling of maybe having some career burnout or maybe wanting to stay home with their children and really wanting a change for their future, but they relied on this paycheck. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where we were when we found the community mm -hmm. and it really just kind of opened our eyes to a way of thinking about how we um, treated our money, mm -hmm. being intentional about our money, and just really realizing that there were people who were saving really large portions of their incomes who were not working, you know, these ridiculous jobs. These were you know, people in engineering, people working regular jobs who were able to save 40% or more. And that was kind of the light switch for us to say, 
if they can do that with what they're earning, we certainly can find a way to change things when we're making the incomes that we're making. Mm -hmm. And from there, we kind of reverse engineered everything and started working on this plan. Yeah, let, let's unpack that and let's let's yeah. do it maybe segment by segment. And sure. so so if we start with, you know, you went to, to law school and, and, you know, so your education took, uh, if I could count that, you know, uh, an undergrad degree, uh, a graduate doctoral degree program. Yeah. And so the amount of time that it took you to get to that point, you know, there there probably felt like some some desires at the end of that tunnel, you know, you worked really, really hard to, to achieve that goal. And, and then you wanted to see the fruits of that labor. And I think that's, that's very common. It, in fact, I, I think it's, you know, worthy. You get, you really worked toward that. And then you, you started to, to realize that, you know, just incrementally your lifestyle and, and started to increase in, in such a way that you, you guys got to a point where you thought that, uh, that you needed to make a change. Hmm. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, our, our student loans were a big portion of that. And we really felt like, at least our mindset was, is like we have time to mm -hmm. pay off the student loan debt until we were 46 and looking at each other and like, well, yeah. we don't really have more time. <laughs> like we don't yeah. have more time and we don't have any retirement. What are, what are we gonna do? Mm -hmm. what, what can we do to fix it? Yeah, so that, that change in thinking, you had this, this this come to, to Jesus moment for, yes. for lack of a better, better way to describe it is that we need in order to, to change our situation and create something that we don't currently have, we need to start doing things that we're not currently doing. Yeah. Right. And so, so talk to me a little bit more about how you discovered the financial independence community. Uh, for anybody that's listening, unfamiliar with this community, this is really a community driven on some, some basic principles in terms of, of saving really as much money as you can, but saving substantially more or, or less than you spend in such a way that, that there's, there's margin in your life so that you can, can give that margin a job. And, you know, if that's to, to save for retirement or to, to save so that you can work fewer hours to really take control of your life from a, a point of view that you're deciding what's important to you and really driving everything toward those goals. Yes. Yeah. I think a lot of it had to do before we even got into it. There was a lot of conversations and a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of large, <laughs> large poster boards and everything that went around mm -hmm. before, you know, on my part where I had to come around to it. Wendy is the numbers person. And, you know, I, my, my role is, I, you know, I go out and work, put the money where it needs to be and make sure that everything is paid. But, you know, gradually, she had started bringing me in to, you know, making sure we're maximizing our money and making sure we're doing the right thing with our money. I had a, a plan in my brain long before <laughs> we actually e executed it because um, he, he didn't come around to the same time as me. And, and I had to kind of let him catch up to this idea of, if we do X, Y, and Z, this is what we could have at age 55. And this is where we could be. So, you know, while he's, you know, I'm laying these breadcrumbs and he's slowly consuming information and um, seeing these spreadsheets until he finally does come around and we're both on the same page about the plan. And then it was like, yeah. here we go. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. on it. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, we started looking at you know what we were spending we started looking at how we can cut it out do, do we need this in our household uh you know the cable we started looking at the little things that we can save money with that you know we're still going to have entertainment in our house but do we need this extra you know and you know the, the extra tv in the house no we can have family movie night with one tv and not have everybody in different rooms and so you know, as we dug deep into it, you know, myself and Wendy continued to have more conversations on what we could do to make it even better. 
Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of uh, common common threads there. You know, and I, I think that in, in most uh, in most situations, there's probably going to be one partner who uh, who is really into the numbers, and then another partner who, who plays plays catch up a little bit along the way. And so, Wendy, you didn't have any any real strong moments in the front uh, where where you said to Curtis, "Hey, Curtis, we're selling your boat." Or anything like that, right? You 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 no, you eased him in, right? Yeah. Eased him in. I think you know the big the big moment where I felt like okay, he he's really understanding kind of what I'm talking about here is I was coming home from one of my trips to Phoenix, which was where my practice was, and you know I drive six hours there and six hours back, so I'm listening to podcasts the whole way and every, you know, time I hear something, I'm like, Hey babe, you got to listen to this. And, and so I've been doing that and he finally listened. Like he finally listened to one of the podcasts that was my favorite. And, um, I came home and I like put out this spreadsheet and, um, showed him on personal capital, like, look, you know, look at these numbers, like this, this could happen. And he got, kind of that silent nod that he gets yeah. and I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's on board. Woo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and she wasn't trying to push the issue. No. I mean, every family is going to be different. Like you can't just with me, you can't just go, this is what we're going to do. It, you'll have a lot of apprehension. And I'll be like, no, unless the bills are paid, we're not doing anything yeah. else like this. So and you see how her voice changed. She did feed it to me like here, this is what you need to see, you know, <laughs> and I, I look at it and, and it, you know, it made sense to me that, okay, we can start doing this. We're not going to lose our car. We're not going to lose our house. If we start, you know, dipping in and, and cutting away at a lot of things. So, you know, that, and it really like, it became like almost like a game mm -hmm. for us to like really take a look at, you know, going back three months and looking at our, our banking and saying, okay, well, did you realize we spent $2,500 on food mm. last month? <laughs> like who in the, on earth needs $2,500 worth of food? Yeah. Like we can surely cut that. And even if we cut it a few hundred dollars, mm -hmm. that's a few hundred dollars. Yeah. And so we just started questioning everything. Mm -hmm. Every single thing is like, okay, is this, is this something that we want in our lives? Is this something that we can cut out entirely or is this something that maybe we can either scale back or do in a different way where it still brings us joy, mm -hmm. but maybe we don't need it every week or a couple times a week. Maybe it's every Friday. And so like one of those things that we, we kept and we still keep is pizza, pizza Friday Fridays. for our kids. Like yeah. they, that is something that they love. They know Friday's pizza Friday. And you know, sometimes we'll change it up and do some other sort of takeout, but that's Friday. And mm -hmm. that's part of our, family time it's part of our budget and it's something that brings us joy and so we just budget for it yeah that is awesome and it reminds me of something that my friends brad and jonathan from the choose fi podcast say a lot and basically spend money where you value it and don't feel guilty about it and then when there are areas where you're spending money and you don't get that value those are the areas where you can cut ruthlessly and so I'm glad to hear you guys haven't done away with Pizza Friday because it means no. something to your family. And that's important. Yeah. 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 You know, I think another big thing is when we do, if we have to make a big purchase, you know, over $500, we'll sit down and do our pros and cons, you know, when it comes mm -hmm. down to it. And, and, you know, once we make a decision, again, just like you said, we don't feel bad afterwards because mm -hmm. we discussed it and we know that it'll fit in to what we're doing and how we're going to move forward. And it, it just makes us, you know, more cohesive when we talk about finances. Absolutely. So uh, a couple of months ago, my wife and I did a video together. It's the first time I got her on camera. We did a video on, on, on how to create a monthly budget. And so we walked through the practice that, that we use to create our monthly budget. And I, I assume that you guys do some sort of monthly budgeting. What does that look like for you guys? Do you, do you do it at the beginning of the month and then update it as time goes on? Or do you track throughout the month? How do you guys do that? Because I know everybody does this a little differently. Yeah, he's pretty hands off on the budget. I'll come to him and we'll discuss like any major um, changes that need to occur in our budget. But um, I have a budget in a Google Doc and it's already pre-done. And so all I have to do is if there's tweaks that I need to make for the upcoming month, 
a few weeks or a week before I go in and I make those changes. And then as we get our paydays, I'll go back in and um, highlight um, what's been done. So I know everything in yellow, we've already got this paycheck and we've already paid these things. And we operate on a zero-based budget with that spreadsheet. And then the additional thing that I, I just um, really have made a habit, um, and it's a new habit, is I now go into Mint um, probably a couple times a week and I categorize all of our spending so that um, I can kind of just keep track. Is there like maybe an area that I'm not, um, you know, we're not staying on yeah. target that we need to maybe rein in a little bit, mm -hmm. but so it's a combination, it's a combination of both. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's perfect. When you start to talk about that, you guys spent $2,500 one month on food. <laughs> it's important to, to track it in some way because yeah. you, you would have never known that had you not counted it one month. And no, you're yeah. like, where did, how can we earn, you know, this much money and not have any money left over? Oh, wow. Well, because we ate it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. And also celebrate your wins, you know, just yeah. this past month, um, she looked at the budget again and, we started increasing a little bit more into my uh, 403B and my uh, 457. And so, you know, that was a big win. That helps, you know, me like, okay, we can start adding more if we start, you know, staying on track with your budget and, you know, seeing all the wins that you can have mm -hmm. throughout the month or even quarterly or even yearly. So that's... I keep, um, he said I keep posters. I have these big, huge post-it notes and where I keep like trackers and, stuff and so like I track I track okay have we met our goal for this sinking fund or have we you know we want to have another um we want to buy another um, um property, property. <laughs> rental property there you, you go. know before the end of the year um and so I'm tracking okay how close are we to that mm -hmm. um so ha having those kind of visual reminders too of our progress is something that I think has been really helpful. Yeah. All right, two things I want to unpack there. I don't think I've done a video on a sinking fund yet, so would you would you mind talking about what that is? Yeah, sure. So a sinking fund uh, is where you're putting money for maybe, it can be for a couple different things. It can be for, like, let's say you're saving up for a car, so you know that you're going to spend $5,000 on a, on a used car, and so every single month you're putting $100 or so in that sinking fund for that car. So that's one example. But another example is, let's say you know that every year your car registrations cost you $1,000 total. Mm -hmm. So you're putting away $120 or whatever that is, yeah. $80, whatever the math is, mm -hmm. a month um, to go into that sinking fund so that you're not having to scramble and rearrange your budget when it comes time to pay that registration. Yeah, that, and that's fantastic advice. You know, these are known expenses that, that happen on some frequent basis. And so you want to make sure you're covering them so that when, when, when it comes time to get license plates or registration, anything like that, it, it's, it's not, not sneaking up on you because you knew right. it was coming. Right, and then you don't have to take it from your emergency fund either so that your emergency fund truly is an emergency fund. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so the other thing you talked about there was, I, it sounds like you guys are both still W-2 employees, but you're looking at additional streams of income, different ways to diversify the way you're bringing money in. And you mentioned rental property. Tell, mm -hmm. Talk to me about how you think rental property fits into your overall plan uh, to, to get yourself in a, in a lower position of debt and ultimately to a point where you're, you're letting money work for you. Yeah. Um, so Kurt is a W-2 employee. Mm -hmm. I am self-employed still. I no longer have my practice, but I have my other, other businesses. But um, you're, you're absolutely correct in that rental properties factor into our overall plan. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of this reverse engineering that we did that we talked about in the beginning is that we knew that at 46, knowing what we would need to live on to retire early, because we really do want that ability when we get to 55, mm -hmm. um, we knew that we would not be able to save that amount of money to put in, like, for instance, index funds mm -hmm. to give us the amount of um, interest or, or whatever that we needed um, to live on. And so we really had to think about, okay, well, what other 
ways could we then provide us with a monthly income at 55 since our investments will not be where they need to be? How can we close that gap? Mm -hmm. And so we figured what we were going to have with his pension, because he's going to get a pension at 55. We know that that's a dollar amount. Um, we know from my businesses that have perpetual income, um, will have perpetual income coming in from them, kind of what that dollar amount is going to be. So let's say the number is we need to live on $5,000 a month at 55. We have 1,000 provided for and another 1,000 provided for. So we need to find something that's going to close that $3,000 a month gap. And for us, what made the most sense was real estate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because we felt that we could, we had enough time. We had, you know, at that point, we had eight years to get as many rental properties as we needed to cash flow that $3,000 mm -hmm. that would then provide for um, our income at retirement. So then we wouldn't even actually need to touch our investments if we didn't want to. So okay. that's kind of, that was our thought mm -hmm. process. That's how we kind of reverse engineered our um, entry into becoming real estate investors. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a great way to think about it. You know, when you start to, to think about what is my lifestyle going to cost and how do I get there? And if there is a gap between the two, what am I going to do that's above and beyond or in mm -hmm. some way uh, extraordinary to, to the point where we're going to do something that maybe is a little bit out of our comfort zone. I, I don't mm -hmm. think that either of you had a significant uh, background in real estate before you beforehand, uh, but but to increase your skill set and find another way to, to create an opportunity to add revenue to your situation. And I commend you guys for that because it's a way to a way to step outside of, of what you previously knew uh, and, and ultimately learn a new skill that has value in the marketplace. So that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit, you know, you guys have been working this plan for, for three years now, or maybe a little more, and it sounds like you've got about nine years to go. How do you guys stay motivated? You know, it, it, it's easy to think about, you know, this is off in the distance nine years, mm -hmm. but, you know, on a random Tuesday afternoon, when you get the urge to, to just surf Amazon or, or whatever, whatever your impulse <laughs> of your choice is, how do you, how do you keep yourself honest and keep yourself motivated? Um, we have five years, so we, bo we both um, recently turned 49, so yeah. we've been on the plan for three years, we've got five years to go till we, five and a half years till we turn uh, 55, and that's our goal. Um, so we stay motivated, I think one of the big ways is just really being committed to our, our why, and our why mm -hmm. has always been our kids, that, that we want to neither one of us grew up with money. Neither one of us had parents that talked to us about money. Um, and I don't expect anything from m my family when, when they're gone. And we, we really just wanted to create a different legacy for our children, a business for our children. And we didn't want them to see in the same financial situations that we were. Um, and so our kids are really it. I yeah. mean, we can look at them and just be reminded every day that this is the legacy that we're building for them and bringing them into the business and teaching them about money and talking them about interest and, um, you know, working through, um, you know, a, a worksheet with my daughter or my older, oldest son on, you know, how to decide if a property is a good investment or not. Just all of those mm -hmm. things, I think, light a fire for both of us. Yeah. And so that's really how we stay motivated. It's just, it's all around family for us. Yeah. <laughs> it's just how it is. <laughs> and there's those times where we have those Tuesdays where it's like, oh, I can't get that. And it's just like, it's not in the plan. It's not, you know, going to go the way we need to. So we'll just sit and talk about it and just wipe it out. So Or we find a way to make it in the plan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we do. We find yeah. a way. I, I really, really love that. You know, you, you, what you're doing has a purpose and the purpose behind it is your family. And that's absolutely commendable. It's, it's something that I can, can really resonate with. I, I've got a nine month old. And so as, oh. as time goes by, you know, I, I, I get excited as nerdy as this sounds for the days that I can start to teach her things like this. And, <laughs> yeah. and I know as soon as she's able to talk, she is not going to care. But maybe yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's going to take years and years. Mm -hmm. 
but that's okay because yeah. it's, it's all part of the fun and so you guys are you're changing your family tree and you're doing it for the better and so i applaud the the efforts that you're making and the the, the sacrifices that you're making to do that because you know you you guys could could be living that american dream and you say it mm-hmm. in air quotes uh <laughs> that that is over leveraged and quite frankly broke the majority of the time and, and right. people don't generally stop to think about what the long-term ramifications of the American dream can be. And when you start to frame it in such a way that you guys have, the American dream is, is leaving a legacy for your family that, uh, that they can be proud of. And I think that that's probably the, the greatest thing you can leave to your kids. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, that's really awesome. Thanks. So to, to put a frame of reference to all the things we've been talking about, give me a time frame from when you started to now what sort of financial position improvement have you guys made and what does what does that mean for for what's looking ahead yeah so in the in the three years or so um since we started this plan we have gotten rid of 600 over six hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of our debt so a big portion we've gotten rid of all of our consumer debt Uh, we sold our house Mm -hmm. um so between um just some really aggressive um, debt snowball and debt avalanche plus selling our house, we were done with six hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars. What's left is our student loans, and he, fortunately, as a t- teacher, um, his will be paid off through PSLF. Uh-huh. Um, so that will take care of one hundred and twenty thousand yes. of that, and then the remainder is mine. Which we're not sure what we're going to do with that. We may just keep that as low as possible mm-hmm. until it gets forgiven in 20 and 45 years, or we may pay it off. It just really depends on the growth of both my business and our rental properties. If the numbers make sense to pay it off early, we will. If it doesn't, then we'll just keep paying those until um, they expire. (laughs) Got it. Well, those are huge numbers to wipe away from from your debt journey. And I I think the the strategy behind making sure you're you're sending your dollars to the most effective place possible is a great one. And I totally get why you're why you're thinking about it that way. So that is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that people will see that, you know, even though they might not have as much debt as Mm -hmm. we do that, you know, if you really approach it strategically and and really think about and are intentional about what you're doing with your money and, you know, overlay that with what your goals are that you really can make some big progress Mm -hmm. in short amount of time. Yes. That that is awesome. So with, with that being said, Curtis, Wendy, are you guys willing to join me as the first ever tandem couple to answer the how to cues in a rapid style uh, (laughs) cue? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're ready. Let's go. All right. Question one. What is the best book that you've read in the last 12 months? <laughs> Me? Yeah. You I'm that. the book reader. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I loved Christine Bryce's Quit Like a Millionaire. That was probably my favorite mm. money book that I read, and I'm going to cheat and give two. Um, <laughs> the other one was, um, it was a historical fiction book. And now the title is escaping me, but I read it after reading uh, Ron Chernow's Hamilton book because I was so like ah into the Hamilton story that I just, I couldn't get enough. And so I read, um, shoot, I think I have a picture of it. Okay. Uh, it's a historical, <laughs> this is not rapid fire, is it? No, uh, it's, it's not. <laughs> like, I just wait. love books. We're talking about books. Um, but anyways, Dear Eliza, that's what it was. There we go. Um, it was a historical fiction, and oh, it was just so good. Yeah. That's awesome. We'll link I to both. Typically read money books, but yes. that was one treat I gave myself. Sure, sure. We'll link to both of those books in the show notes. So question number two, what is one podcast you're subscribed to? We're subscribed to the, I'm subscribed to the Choose Five podcast. Sure. Yeah. Brad and Jonathan are friends oh, yeah. of mine and friends of the show. Yeah. And so I, I can't recommend them highly enough. And I want to give a, another plug here that I believe you guys have done some podcasting of your yeah. own. Yeah. yeah, we have. We uh, Our podcast is House of Fi. Yeah. And um, we, we've got about a year and a half worth of um, 
um, recordings on there. And mm -hmm. we might be back, but right we now might. we're on a little bit of hiatus. There we go. I'll link to that in the notes for this episode as well, so that if people are interested, they can check that out. Mm -hmm. So question number three, what is the best recent purchase you've made of less than $100? The best purchase that I made recently was for my YouTube channel. And it's this little, because I still record on my iPhone mm -hmm. and I really was struggling with um, audio mm -hmm. um, for it. And so I bought this little tripod that plugs into my phone and has a little microphone on the top of it. And it's been great. It really was like, it was maybe 60 bucks. And now I really feel like I don't need to buy a camera anytime soon. Like I can use this setup for a while. So I was really happy about it. And now he's, he uses it too. Yeah, I use it all, as <laughs> for well. For his coaching, his coaching meetings. Yeah. I think mine was, I like purchasing tools. So I go to Harbor Freight and I think uh, it was a little socket set that, came in handy every time I, I needed to do something and I had a coupon a 20% off coupon <laughs> with it so I came up I think it was like $5.95 from $15 so there you go Harbor Freight is such a cool place oh, it's addictive it's <laughs> absolutely dangerous all right question four what time did you guys wake up this morning I'm an early riser. I was up at 6.30. I wake up whenever the sun comes out. I think mine was 10 o'clock. Yes. <laughs> different strokes for different folks. Oh, There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. She lets me sleep, so that's the great part about that is it. True. She I lets me let sleep. You sleep. There you go. Question number five. What color is your toothbrush? White and blue. Yep, white and blue. There, there you go. Blue. This is really just a question <laughs> to figure out if people know that answer. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's fun. And question number six, where can people find out more about you if they want to connect with you? Yeah, these days um, we're mostly on our YouTube channel, which is House of Fi as well. And then our blog is houseoffi.com, which has links all through that to the podcast as well. The podcast is on anywhere you can find podcasts at House of Fi. Very cool. Curtis, Wendy, it has right. been an honor to, to talk with you and get to share some of your story and just share the, the thought behind what you guys are doing is replicable. And if, if other people are interested in doing it, it, it takes small steps, but you can re achieve big results with it. And so thank you for joining me today. That was an absolute blast. I want to give a special thanks to Wendy and Curtis Mays for joining me on the show and hopefully you got as much value out of that as I did. That's going to bring this episode of the show to a close and so if you liked what they had to say or if you got value out of this show in some way or another, hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm to let YouTube and other people know that this was a video worth watching and hit the subscribe button so that you can be the first to know about new videos that are gonna come to the How To Show. They're still coming out every Wednesday and I still have fun doing it and so I hope you have fun watching them. If you've got an idea or you've got any feedback for the show or feedback for this episode specifically, leave a comment in the comment section. I respond to all of those and maybe we can get Wendy and Curtis to respond to anything specific if that happens. So until next time, this is Anthony Drew Gary, host of the How-To Show, signing off.